Welcome to Pagan Coffee Talk. Here are your hosts, Oswin and Lord Knight. Welcome to Pagan Coffee Talk. I'm Chase Knight Smith, and today with me is Lord Oswin. Hi. What are we talking about today? All right, so here's a little topic, and we're just going to say it's um, for the greater good. What the fuck is the greater good? That's actually a very good question. Is there even a definition? See, I don't know. I mean, how can how can we define the greater good if we can't even define... What good is? Right. Pure good and pure evil. Let's think about this. I mean, there's a lot of gray areas there. <laughs> a lot. All right. Shooting an animal that's in distress because, well, they're just going to be in pain the rest of their lives. Right. You know. I mean, last year we had an incident like that and, you know, we took an animal out to the tree line and your dad shot it yep so is that i mean the dog was suffering you know i i think it got bit by a snake and yeah i mean it had some kind of necrotic tissue on it right it was so, just so, like so wasting us away killing it was bad why or was it good yeah, I mean, I, I see that as a good thing. I mean, we were we were helping the animal. But yet there are other people that would think, well, why didn't you take it to the vet and do all this other stuff, even though it might be suffering for the rest of its life in traumatic pain? And Well, the dog had maggots on it. I mean, come on. But that's my point. I mean, <laughs> but that's my point is nobody can define because I can I can see people, it's the baby Hitler thing again. True, yeah. You know, no matter, it's a catch-22. And, and there's your problem with what I think is your problem with going, oh, well, to the greater good. Because now you're leaving it up to something that might not exist on a plane of existence we do, and its ethics and morals are slightly different than ours. Mm, true. All right? Mainly because they might have different options than us to take care of a problem. Right. You follow me on that? Yeah, no. I mean, that, that makes perfect sense to me. So I was watching an anime. The Seven Deadly Sins. Anyway, okay, they yeah. send two of the characters back in time. If they pick the wrong choice, they're overwhelmed in darkness and they die. If they get killed, they die. <laughs> so, anyway, one of them, apparently, the way they were looking at it, they thought only had two choices. Either surrender to the darkness or die was the option this person was given. And when the person wakes up, and apparently unharmed by all this, they're like, well, what did you do? Oh, I ran away. There was a third option. Oh. This, to me, demonstrates what I'm talking about with us. We're only looking at it here where there's actually maybe a third option that you can have on a different plane of existence. Okay. So you're holding it up to something and saying to the greater good. Is it to its greater good or our greater good or your greater good? Well, and even then, who's to say what that greater good is? I, thank you. I mean, my greater good is not the same as yours. Who's to say it's not the same on that other plane of existence? One deity or one entity may see the greater good as world destruction. Right. But yet the other one may see it as, you know, flowers and rainbows and fucking unicorns. Well, I mean, you also have religions that believe, okay, if you believe in our gods and our ways, that's good. Right. And everything else outside of that is bad. But everybody outside that religion is looking at them going, wait, wait a minute. And before you sit there and go, hey, they, no, 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 y'all were talking about my religion. No, think about it. There's more than one religion that does this. Uh, yeah. All, all right? the major so religions do what it. makes your religion correct and all the other ones wrong? I understand, oh, you got so many different religions and so many different beliefs, what in the world to believe in, not to believe in. Right. That's my point about the greater good. Since you can't define it, how in the world are you going to leave it up to it to decide what you're doing or what you want is good or bad? Shouldn't you be able to determine that yourself? Well, I mean, if that's the case, then why do we why do we continuously say things like that? To take responsibilities off ourselves. So it's to make us feel better about something we're doing that may not be exactly on the line of quote or, unquote or, or would make the individual feel guilty about what they're doing. All right. 
because there's part of them that's kind of like, ah, maybe I shouldn't do this. So I'm going to put the greater good. So it does. Well, I mean, wouldn't it be the same thing as the Christian saying, Lord, if it be thy will, then, you know, let this happen. Exactly. Because again, when you're doing it to the greater good, you still fall into that old, uh, uh, oh, the song, God's Unanswered Prayers. What's Garth his name? Brooks. Yeah, sung that song. What was the name of it? Unanswered Prayers. Right. Where he talks about prayers that aren't answered. Right. Because they believe in a greater good and that has to outrule everything else. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And then you're leaving it, what is greater good? What what are we actually talking about? Well, I mean, ultimately, that's that's the question here, and you know, it's, I think this might be this would be an awesome roundtable discussion. It would, you know, have like maybe ten, fifteen people just sitting around. Well, I mean, discussing I'd, their ideas of what is the greater good. Well, I mean, again, this this conversation is still going to fall into the same trap. Each individual is going to be different. That's my problem. Right, but no, I'm just saying that would be the interesting part of this is to see how many, how how people, how different people define what is for the greater good. What is the yeah, greater what, good? What is the greater good? What constitutes that to you? You know, I, I mean, it'd be nice if a lot of people would like mail that in and <laughs> so we could see a list. Yeah, I mean, we could have another discussion on that. You know, of all the different ones and which one, and again, but if you're doing this and you're putting it up to the greater good, what are you actually putting it up to? Right. And are you prepared for any and all quote unquote consequences for leaving it up to that? I mean, because the greater good might be just the backslap you into the middle of next week. Well, and you know, it's, I mean, the greater good could also mean death of some kind. It could mean losing something. I, I, again, it, it's, it's, it's that whole problem where I have where back in the day where they kept on doing the rituals, and now I'm going to put healing energies into the earth. Right. Okay, what are you actually doing? Okay, first of all, how in the world can we presume that we are powerful enough or anything like that to heal the earth, a planet? Right. All right? In, in scope, I believe the planet's a hell of a lot more powerful than the rest of us because we can't live without her. She can live without us. Right. So you do this spell, and suddenly New Orleans gets flooded. But it was for the greater good to right. heal the earth. Right. Right. No, yeah, but that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because if you leave it up to the earth, the earth may decide, well, you know what? We need to get rid of some people. It's about time for California to fall into the, or into the ocean. Right. Could that be the answer, the greater good's answer to your problem, to your question? Or, better yet for you climate enthusiasts, climate change where, you know, we have a new ice age coming in. How many fucking people are going to die in an ice age? Well, even if it goes the other way. How yeah, many yeah absolutely. Die? Yeah. If things get hotter instead of colder. It, either way, people are going to die. But you know what? That's for the greater good because for, the earth needed healing. Right. Even though it's been here billions of years longer than we have. So... <laughs> I'm back to, are you really prepared for the consequences of your actions? Right. To handle those consequences. And, and this is where I think it is. It, it, to me, it sounds like I am giving up responsibility because if, if this spell goes off and ruins somebody's life, it's not my fault. It's for the greater good. Okay. That's mm -mm. an excuse. Yeah. You, you still can't skirt that responsibility. It still falls back on you. Right, and then, and then you have, still have these people that are doing this, and they think this obfuscates them from any repercussions of said spell. Now, I've argued, is back, well, what I hear people call backlash, is it really backlash, or is backlash, right. the fact is, is that you've sent a spell out to harm someone who happens to have a greater will than you, right. and it returns back to, to you. This is a real backlash of spells. Right. The fact is, is that you got people out there and they are casting spells willy nilly like fucking idiots because, oh, I'm better than everybody else. I know more than everybody else. Wise people do not go around and say that. I'm going to sit there and tell you right now. I'm not. Mm -mm. I'm not wise enough to know everything that's going to happen with the spell and what in the world's going on. Nobody oh, no, does. No. There's too many. There's too many variables to keep in your head on that. 
yes, we can see where in the world the likely path is to a spell and what it's going to do to people. But sitting there claiming it's for the greater good because you've destroyed the person down the road's life because you wanted something. Well, and then too, I mean, like you said, we can see the most likely path, but there's no guarantee that it would 100% every time going to take that path. Oh, but no, as long as I put this, there's no responsibility on me. Yeah, fuck that. There's no responsibilities of my actions because I said for the greater good. Mm -mm. I think the greater good would have then dropped you should have done dropped you on your ass a long time ago i think so yeah personally i just think people need to leave it out of their spells and start accepting responsibilities for their actions well and again even if you're gonna put it in there just understand you are still responsible for that yes you're the one putting it out you're the one that set this in motion exactly you put it out there guess what it's coming back to you because the way i'm looking at it that quote unquote greater good or that source of creation, they're the ones creating the fabric of fate to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yes, we only have the ability to fuck with it a little, mess with it, rearrange it slightly, but it's like renting a apartment. Yes. You can decorate it, move your furniture out all you want, but you can't start moving around walls and knocking holes and stuff. Right. (laughs) You're limited. You're limited. We're limited in what we can do to a certain extent. Because trust me, if the gods want it that way, that's the way it's going to be. Well, sure, yeah. Regardless of what the world I do or anybody else. So. I think that's about it. I think that is too. I'm out of coffee. So let's discuss children and craft. Okay. Now, for many, I don't know about you, but for many years, I actually believed like everybody else that people of, people who had kids of craft maybe shouldn't teach their kids Mm -hmm. or let them uh, be a part of Mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Um, Why is that? Why did you believe that? The freedom to choose. Okay. Because in craft, that's one of our main things we honestly believe in is people should have the ability to choose. You should, you should be able to choose whatever religion you want to be. So it wasn't like when we were growing up and we were forced to go Go to to church, church and the Christian church, you did, you always believed that, that force indoctrination sort of was bad. Okay. But now that I've gotten older and I've thought about it a little bit more, I'm not so dead set on that. Why not? I've seen where people like Lady Keegan Mm -hmm. are raising their kids sort of in the pagan tradition but not like shoving it down their throats at the same time okay again i still do not believe that children especially pre pubescent kids belong in ritual space okay that's to me still bad form because there's too much sexual energy there right. and i think it messes up the kids right and has them start doing stuff they shouldn't be doing at too young of an age but other than that all the other stuff go for it Start teaching your kids. Now, what I believe is don't get all upset if one of your kids come home and goes, well, I've decided to be Catholic instead. Right. Don't fly off the handle or anything like that. Look at him and go, okay. I, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I still don't think pagan parents should pick their child's religion, but I don't think you should be hiding this stuff from them anymore. Right. What do you think? Well, that's what I was getting ready to say a oh. while ago. <laughs> and you rudely cut me off. Oh. No, I, th- I think it's okay. Um, like the way Lady Keegan's doing it. She's, you know, she homeschools her kids. Mm-hmm. But I think even if you're not homeschooling, you can still do this. Right. And it's go through aspects of other religions with your kids Teach them a little bit about Christianity. Teach them a little bit about Buddhism. Teach them a little bit about this and a little bit about that. Greek history, Roman history. Throw it in there and you can mix it in just fine. You know what I mean? Right. And that way your kid's not getting a whole dose of one thing. Well, I'm still back to it. Parents need to instill in kids the same values that they believe in if not even more. Right. You know, 
uh, again, I know Lady Keegan is trying her best to instill into her kids the um, the whole entire concept of keep your word and being responsible for your actions. Right. You know, uh, she's so it makes me wonder when they grow up, since they've been taught this from a very young age, what are they going to be like as adults? How moral of a person are they going to be? Because they got these from day one. Again, I've, I've talked about this before. I remember her sitting there telling me stuff about, you know, making her kids milkshakes at 10 o'clock at night. Right. Because she promised, because she made a promise. What in the world are her kids going to be like? <laughs> right. Because she didn't start learning this until she was older. Well, hopefully, I mean, it's going to make them better people. And just in their interactions with people on a daily basis. It's going to, you know, they're going to be that type of person where, one, they're going to be reliable because people are going to know. They said they were going to do something. They're going to do it. But I don't think you can sit there and not teach your kids this stuff and trying to hold off on it because you didn't want to teach them religion and just not teach them any moral or ethic or any ethical foundation to work with at all. Well, no. That you see what I'm saying? There's you can do that without teaching the religious part of it. That's where my problem became of this. Are we avoiding not teaching morals and ethics to our kids to the extent of to avoid teaching them a religion? Well, again, I, it's just like I said before. You can do that without teaching any I, of the no, spiritual I, or religious aspects. I know. I know that. You know that. Well, no, okay. I'm, I'm putting that out there so that people know okay. if this is your reason, that doesn't have to be your reason because you can do that without, without teaching, teaching the religious religions. Right. So I don't, you, so you have to do this, but are, is this one of the things that we are actually doing to our, to some of these kids that are growing up? Could be. Yeah. Because I, I know when I was younger, we had a lot of teenagers and, or tweens or teenagers and mm-hmm. preteens and all this running around and their parents didn't hide this stuff from them. But then they were following the more old school thing of, well, I can't teach my kids religion. So, you know, how in the world do I teach these morals and standards without diving into religion? Right. And so there was, I think there might've been a pull too much of a pull back from that. Probably, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Because people were scared. Well, if I start teaching this, that means I'm going to have to go down that road. If I'm sitting here trying to teach something out of the Ten Commandments, oh, that means I'm going to eventually have to go to, well, that's because we get these ideas from the Ten Commandments. Well, where did that come from? Well, you know, that may be the case, but that doesn't mean that you have to delve into that right away. Start teaching the moral things, and then once the kids get older... Into their teens. But again, I'm back to it. I can see where people would think this. Right. Like I said, I understand people's, a lot of pagans' reluctance to, quote unquote, indoctrinate your kids. Right. I don't have a problem with it. I understand that, but. Well, I don't, I don't see teaching morals and ethics as indoctrination to a religion. Is it indoctrination? Yeah. <laughs> I well, mean, and, let's and face I, it. And I think some people might think that because these ethics, we get a lot of these ethics and morals from religious institutions. Well, we do, but that doesn't mean we have to teach the religious aspect of this. I know it, it, it sounds like a contradiction of terms. It, well, it just might be us in America, but I'm sorry, or ra- the way we were raised is hard for me not to think of not murdering and, you know, that murder is a crime, while at the same time realizing that it is one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit murder. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? That there's an automatic social link there that I think a lot of people think that opens up that door to teach those religions. Right, but, all right, even if it does... Because I would, I would ask you... I would. I'd ask you this, all right, just for a moment, all right? Not, not trying to piss you off. All right. Think back when you were an actual Christian and you would have ran across one of these kids that their parents didn't teach them any of this stuff. Okay. And they start questioning why you have these values and stuff. What are you going to tell them? 
I know most, well, Christians, most to Christians are going to go, oh, no, 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 because God tells us to. And we've gotten these commandments and this stuff out of this Bible. And he tells us how we should live our life. Right. Is exactly how in the world that's going to happen outside of that household. Right. That's the typical response. Well, the Bible tells so, us this. But you see what I'm saying? And the Bible is the word of God. So, you know, and, and then again, you still have this whole entire thing. As soon as this happens, now you got that kid going back to their pagan parents going, well, you know, Sally told me about this and blah, blah, blah. And it seems like it just brings it all well, back together again. All right. Well, when I said you can do you can do one without the other, and you can to a point. Right. But here's the thing. When something like that happens, that's a natural evolution of learning for that kid. That's when you need to address that. And besides that, I mean, you, you can go into, hear me out, you can go into the murder is wrong. Right. Because Christianity is not the only religion who says murder is wrong. So you can still create that balance and you can still give your kid the choice. You can teach them, okay, well, in Christianity, they say this about murder. In paganism, we say this about murder. Buddhists say this. Taoists say this. So you can still give, you see what I'm saying? You can still create that balance. My question is, is, but if you would have discussed religions with your kid earlier Mm -hmm. when these incidents happen these kids will your kid would automatically understand that in christianity it's one of their tenants to do this well sure yeah Uh, do you see what i'm saying and as soon as you you can look at a kid going no it's their tenant to do this they're they're everybody is told that they have to sell their religion to you well, yeah. yeah. In which that, if the kid knows that ahead of time, they might look at this conversation completely different. All right? Because, I mean, that's that's my point there is, it's kind of like not talking to your kids about sex. That normally leads to a lot of problems down the road later. Yeah, but I think, I think the issue you run into or the issue that people are going to run into is how young is too young? Where do you start that conversation? Well, At what I, age? Again, this is back in them when I hate myself for saying this. You know, if they don't learn it from you, they're going to learn it out on the street. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot what I don't know, PSA but that, was, that was when we were kids. But yeah. I was going to say that was back from when we were kids. So that was <laughs> at least 30, 30, 40 we, some odd years ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, oh my lord, but again, is this not true? I remember being kids, and this is sort of how I learned about sex along the way was what my buddies at school said in the whole nine yards and having to figure it out for myself and all that. But do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and then religion seems even 10 times more complicated about something we biologically fall into easily (laughs) well and it does but then i'm back to because like i remember growing up in the christian church we didn't actually get into like bible study lessons until we were in probably like fifth or sixth grade in school until we were around that age and then they started teaching us lessons from the bible i mean i remember going to sunday school but I don't remember how old I was. Well, see, I don't either. But I mean, I'm just saying up, in, up until a certain <laughs> point, it was, you know, kind of like being in the nursery. Right. You just, you show up, you play with your friends for an hour, and then you go to a Sunday service. Yeah. You know? right. No, you didn't even, in our church, you and didn't then, even go to a Sunday service. You still stayed in the nursery, and the nursery piped the well, the nursery in there. Yeah, I mean, the nursery, <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying, even slightly older kids, that's pretty much the way it was for yeah. us up until a certain point. And then when we reached, like I said, probably fifth or sixth grade age. That's when things started changing. That's when things started changing, and they started actually teaching us some lessons. And, and morals and stuff like that when they think you're old enough right, to handle so, it. I'm back to if you're going to advocate teaching the spiritual or slash religious side of this along with those morals and ethics, at what age do well, you start let, that? Well, let me ask you something. What makes you think you can hide this from your kids? 
Well, I don't think any. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I don't. Me personally, you can't. I don't think you're going to be able to. And if you think you can, I think you got another thing coming. Oh, come on. Let's talk about that conversation at Lady Keegan's table with her son, right. where he said he just fed, dropped the beans on her. And I thought she'd fall through the floor. <laughs> yeah, because then she had the realization, oh, crap, my kid knows. Yeah, and I'm not as sneaky as I think I am. <laughs> he knows what I'm doing. Yeah, and I'm not sneaky. No. So, again, what makes you think you can hide this from your kids and not give them answers? Kids are too curious to begin with. I remember right. kid, I would have been like, hey, mom, what about, what about, what about? I mean, and don't get me wrong, I still don't have a problem with infants inside circles. Right. Now, toddlers, a little different, but infants, no problem. For some reason, it seems, well, for us, from toddler all the way up to 18, you know, we, we sort of try to get people to shy away from ritual space. Right. So, uh, mainly because of all that sexual energy, but... Do you see what I'm saying? I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't see how in the world you cannot have these conversations with kids. You think that if I, you're going to teach the morals and ethics, then you need to teach the religious as well. Yes, I, th- I think you at least need to sit down and have honest conversations with your kids, non-biased. This is what it's like to be Christian. If you want to know about it, this is what it's like to be thought. And this is what we do. This is what I well, do. And, and see, I like that because again, you're, you're giving them a balance. You're still giving them a choice. They're learning about other things other than just paganism. Right. And, but the original thought that we, when we first came into this was no, you don't tell kids jack shit. Right. You, you completely cut them off from this and we don't even discuss it. I, I don't see that as completely right. Well, again, you can't hide it from your kids. No. Well, and again, even when you're teaching kids about it, yes, my expectation is you limit it to what the kid can handle at the time. Or what you think they can handle. Right. And then they'll let you know if they can handle more. Right. But then that takes it back to the, the, the comment that I made earlier. There's a natural evolution to the way kids learn. Exactly. And if your kid comes to you and starts asking questions, you need to have those conversations with that kid. Yeah. It doesn't matter what age. If they're asking questions, answer them. You know, I mean, kids are funny because, you know, I, they'll come up to you and they'll ask you this question. You will give them an answer. It's, okay, can I have peanut butter and jelly now? Right, and then it's done. And then it's done and over. You know, two, three months later, they might come back with something else. You remember when you said this? Yeah. Well, what about that? <laughs> Okay, how did we go from, from point? Then, and, um, okay, well, let's sit down and have this conversation. Let's have this conversation. So you have that conversation with them, and then suddenly they look at you and say, okay, can I go outside and play now? Well, yeah. Right. Can I answer your question? Mm. Yeah. Did you even listen? Mm. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Uh, Chico Mark said, pay me a little, I'm a little tough. Oh, yeah. Pay me a lot. I'm a lot tough. Pay me too much. I'm too tough. Right. <laughs> That's kids. That's kids. <laughs> yep. That's kids in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Join us next week for another episode. Peg and Coffee Talk is brought to you by Life Temple and Seminary. Please visit us at lifetempleseminary.org for more information, as well as links to our social media. Facebook, Discord, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. We travel down this trodden path, the maze of stone and mire. Just hold my hand as we pass by a sea of blazing pyres. And so it is the end of our days, so walk with me till morning breaks. And so it is the end of our days, so walk with me till morning breaks.